we do have a slide. Welcome back. Um, not the best slot uh, of the day, just after lunch. Um, but between Sudhir, who runs the South Asian business, and uh, me, Nitin Paranjpe, we'll try and see how we can uh, keep you awake for the next 45 minutes, sharing with you a little bit about the exciting world of food and refreshment. The way we would do this is as follows. I'm going to start off and give you a bit about the global uh, uh, strategy, what we are doing, the progress that we've made. And uh, after that, Sudhir will share with you how that strategy has been landed in South Asia and to give you a sense of the execution and the work which has been done in this area. So let me begin. First, I think, uh, a sense of what this business is. This business came together at the beginning of this year. Two categories food and refreshment came together. The combination of these two means that it's now a 20 billion business, a business that is now large enough for us to compete effectively in the space. It consists essentially of four distinct parts. One of them is foods. The foods business is a little over 7 billion. Then there's an ice cream business which is a little under 7 billion. You have a tea business a little over 3 billion and we have a food solutions business where we sell products to chefs to improve in their lives and make it easier for them, which is about two and a half billion. These four parts of the business accounting for 20 billion have had an historical growth rate of about 3% over the last few years. And uh, that compares reasonably favorably with uh, many of our peer group players. It has a margin of 16% in 2017. There are a few other things that I want to draw your attention to. The actions that we've taken in the recent past, including the divestment of our spreads business, now means that about half our business is in the emerging markets, just under half. And once again, a footprint which compares very favorably compared to many of our peers. And last point is, other than just the scale that we've got, bringing foods and uh, our refreshment business together, the coming together gives us synergies. Synergies in terms of consumer insights and trends, but also in terms of channels where we can play. Overall, it's an exciting business. The coming together has also meant that we now have an absolutely wonderful portfolio of brands. Big global brands like Knorr, Walls, Lipton, Magnum, Hellman's, and the massive food solution business that we've got. Iconic brands in their own right. But in addition to that, we've got a wonderful portfolio of local brands. Brands which are no less, less iconic in the markets in which they play. Brands like Kisan, brands like Brookbond in uh, India, or brands like Robertson's in South Africa, or Bango in Indonesia. Wonderful portfolio. Over the last two years, we've also acquired eight new businesses. Eight businesses which account for 250 million of turnover, and we've also built, over the last year, organically, seven or eight new brands. More new brands built in the last one year than we've possibly done in the previous 10 years. That's just a testament to this Connected for Growth program that we had launched a couple of years ago, and the unleashing of energy and enterprise and innovativeness across the organization, helping us sense consumer opportunity, but also respond to it very, very quickly. So that's really where we are. Now, all of this positions us very well to address the very significant opportunity that the foods market offers, a market which is growing at about 4% per annum. But while this opportunity is significant, we also find that there are very significant changes taking place in the market, changes which we need to respond to, and changes which means that the growth in the market is not uniform. Now, almost entire growth that we see in this market is happening from, emerging, from the emerging markets. And that's relatively easy to understand. You heard in the morning the trends that we talked of. But when you consider the fact that in these markets we are seeing population growth, rising urbanization, more working women, rising affluence, you put all of these together, there are conditions where people have more money but less time, and that means the adoption of value-added and packaged foods and out-of-home consumption is going up. We are starting off with relatively low levels of penetration out here. And all of that offers significant opportunities. But it's not just the emerging markets where there is growth. There is plenty of growth, although in certain segments, even in the developed world. 
In the developed world, we see preferences changing. The growing, the growing health and wellness trend, the concern that people have in terms of what is included in the food means there's a growing uh, that products which are more natural, which are more authentic, which are more clean label, are seeing spectacular growth in these areas. We're also seeing a movement towards more vegan, more vegetarian, plant-based protein. And these are, again, areas where there is growth. The ex growth of digital, new channels coming up, new business model, means that there's virtually everything that you want you can get at a click of a button. And that's driving fragmentation of channels and new opportunities coming up. All in all, uh, uh, a period of considerable change which offers both opportunity as well as challenges. And it is in that context that we need to put in place a strategy for our business. Now, the strategy that we've got is first and foremost um, has as its guidance a North Star, a desire to run a business which has purpose at its heart, a desire to run a business which allows us to deliver food that just tastes, not just tastes good, makes people feel good, but will be a business which is a force for good. That's the North Star. In addition, we need to have a strategy which will enable us to deliver on the role that has been crafted for this business. And that role essentially means we have to step up our growth rates and have a big step up in our margins. A year ago, we had communicated that we'd get this business to about 21% operating margin. And that's what we are working towards. If we have to get to that outcome, there are three key pillars of this strategy, three pillars each one of them requiring a transformative action. The transformation of our portfolio, transformation of our cost structure, and transformation of our capabilities. All three of them need to happen for us to get to the outcomes that we want. And all of this is underpinned by the two key assets that any business has, brands and the people who build those brands, both driven by purpose. Now, it is my firm view that in the days to come, only brands, only brands which have a distinctive point of view about issues facing the world and mattering to people will have any chance whatsoever to be noticed, to stand out, to, uh, to build the sort of consumer love and loyalty that every brand seeks for and craves for, but most don't manage to get. Finding such a purpose is not easy, but there's plenty of evidence that we've got that when you do find such a purpose, it drives growth and it builds consumer preference. And that's what we are trying to do as we move forward. Now, I'm going to touch upon the three pillars that I've talked about, but I'm going to start off with the first one. What is it that we need to do to transform our portfolio? Now, transforming a portfolio as large as the one which we've got is, is not easy. It's, because we've got to start with our core portfolio and make sure that our core brands start incorporating more and more of the trends and the preferences that people have. That's what we are doing with our Knorr. That's what we are doing with our Hellman brands. And that's, that's not easy because every change that you make to make a product into a clean label product means changing ingredients. And when you change ingredients, it risks changing the taste profile and people are extremely sensitive to anything when it comes to food and the changes that we make. So it's a journey that we have to take very carefully as we move forward, but it's a journey that we are on. You would have seen in Europe, for example, changes that we've made to our Knorr brand with a 100% natural range which has been introduced. Kitchen identifiable ingredients in all of this, but it's not just in product, in foods. There are actions that we are taking on our packaging. PG Tips, for example, has moved to packaging in the UK over the next two years across the world, which will mean that all our tea bags will become compostable. There are actions that we are taking in our ice cream. 100% of all our kids' ice cream have less than 110 kilocalories. And we continue to work towards reducing the sugar content without compromising on the taste and the pleasure and the indulgence that people seek from our ice cream business. But as we do this in the core, we also have to make sure that we enter segments which there is growth in. I talked about vegan, vegetarianism, more plant-based eating that is taking place. We need to be present there. We have brands like Magnum, which now have a vegan variant. Ben & Jerry's now has a dairy-free variant which is around. And all of these are seeing great traction because they're consistent with what people are looking for as they uh, today. So that's as far as the... Uh, 
shifting our portfolio to higher growth segments. I want to move on to the aspect of channels. The changes taking place are very significant. They throw up many opportunities, but I want to touch upon two of those, two which excite me. The first one, which is what we call ice cream now. The opportunity to have an ice cream when you want it, when you're sitting in your uh, living room and you don't have enough ice cream uh, in, your, in your fridge. Now, the opportunity that ice cream now is addressing is allowing you to order an ice cream. It leverages the fact that the adoption of mobile technology is very high. Um, there are big, large-scale food delivery platforms which have come up. And you combine partnerships with these delivery platforms along with mobile technology and great precision marketing, it enables you to create a fundamentally different business model. That business model in 2018 has been rolled out. It's been very successful, and we continue to expand it. We consider this to be a very significant opportunity for our business. The second one is what we call the front of house opportunity. You heard me mention that we have a Unilever food service business. That's over two and a half billion in terms of size. That business is essentially focused on delivering products and ingredients to chefs, and that's the back of house business. But we are going to these restaurants and cafes. We have a relationship with them. The coming together of two businesses now offers us an opportunity to sell more tea-based solutions, to sell a wider range of condiments, mayos, ketchups, mustard, et cetera, which are front of house opportunities through which we not just get business, but we build our brands because that's where consumers come and experience our brands. Between these two opportunities in the medium term, it could easily be up to a billion euro opportunity that we see. And the last opportunity that I want to talk about as we look to step up our growth and transform uh, ourselves into faster growing areas is the geography lens. Our business has shifted in terms of our footprint. We are about half. But our ambition is to get to at least 60% of our business coming from the emerging markets. The shift from just under 50 to 60 itself is likely to give you about one point of incremental growth and shifting your sales weighted growth rate to that level. Now, doing that means having sharper focus and investment in the emerging markets, but it also means a very deliberate, conscious m and strategy that we will have. And it is this that brings me to the announcement that you heard yesterday. And I just want to spend some time sharing with you the strategic rationale and why we are so excited with the announcement which was made yesterday. And yes, I'm referring to what many people call the Holix deal. Yeah. Now, what makes this so exciting? I first want to talk about the strategic fit of uh, this business. Now, it is no secret that Unilever is keen to strengthen our presence in the health and wellness segment. Even in our USLP, we had called out the fact that we would look to see how we can touch a billion people and impact and improve their health and well-being. This gives us an opportunity to play out there. It is on trend, consistent, and is likely to give us superior growth as we move forward. It is also no secret that Unilever wants to strengthen its presence in the emerging markets. And this action enables us to get a large business in amongst our best emerging market countries with great capabilities that we've got. It takes the India foods and refreshment business and gives it scale. And it is this strategic fit, but coupled with some other aspects, it's not just the size of the business that we've got here, it's a business which has considerable growth potential in the times to come. Why? Because if you take a market like India and 90% or so of this business that we've got happens to be in India, Nine out of 10 people have micronutrient deficiencies in this country. Four out of 10 people are malnourished, malnourished today. The penetration level of this category is 25%. And if you want to just compare it in terms of what it means versus the rest of the business that we've got, the Hindustan Unilever business, if you take the sales-weighted penetration of the categories that it's present in, it's close to 80%. And this company has had the capacity and the expertise to take relatively penetrated categories and yet have a growth rate of over 10% per annum over the last 20 years. That's the capability that this business has through skills like market development, driving penetration, et cetera. So the, these factors combined with the growing awareness of health and nutrition, the rising affluence means that this category is likely to see considerable growth opportunities in the years to come. 
I've already touched upon a few reasons why it is exciting because it's in India. Because the Indian business will be in a position to unlock tremendous synergies from this. Synergies not just in terms of growth, but also in terms of cost. Where do these come from? They come from many levels, but those of you who heard Sanjeev talk about uh, this business in the morning, you would, you would remember what an incredible distribution machine this is. If I simply take the quality of, uh, or the absolute extent of reach, the physical distribution of this company is somewhere between 4x to 5x, the reach that the Holics brand had through the GSK consumer health business, 4x to 5x. That's the opportunity that you've got. You've also heard about the analytic capability that this company has to do smart selling, and that will make a difference for us. The capacity to drive penetration, the model of market development which has been built in this company, driving sampling, driving access packs, rural penetration, all of this augurs well. And of course, the marketing muscle and the taking this into more uh, premium products, new ranges, segmenting it, et cetera. From a cost perspective, once again, plenty of opportunities that we've got. Whether there are synergies in terms of our supply chain, whether it's the go-to-market operation, whether it is in terms of uh, media buying synergies and savings, procurement benefits that we would get, or simply the overheads leverage that we would get as we combine these businesses. Massive opportunities. It is our belief that this business could grow at over 10% per annum and have a 10 percentage point improvement through the synergies that we've got, and that creates enormous value for us. But to talk you through a little bit in terms of what exactly is involved in this deal, and why it will create such substantial value, I'm going to ask Graham to share with you exactly uh, aspects about that. Thanks, Nitin. Thank you. Um, so yeah, 10% growth and 800 to 1,000 basis points of synergies that we see. Um, it, it was just about 10 years ago that I came back from living in Indonesia uh, to be the head of M&A for Unilever, which I didn't even do for two years. Um, and I passed the baton uh, eight years ago then to James Allison, who, who many of you will remember from his time in IR. And suffice to say that in the 10 years that James and I, you know, we've been, 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 been doing M&A, um, I don't think we've seen a transaction which is either this complex, this interesting to work on, or probably this exciting to, uh, to get done in terms of a transaction, just as a little personal reflection. Um, this is a horribly complicated chart, and, and I, I don't expect everybody to digest it right now, but I do want it to be out there uh, in, in, in the public domain so that we can keep coming back to it. So the business has 550 million of turnover and 155 million of EBITDA. The transaction is, is, is structured principally in three parts. The consumer healthcare business here in India, that's 90% of the business. Uh, and we've paid for that all with the equity of Hindustan Unilever. Uh, that means that Unilever retains a stake um, of, uh, of, of uh, the originally at 67.2 drops down to um, uh, about 5% below that 62 uh, and, and change. Um, GSK business in Bangladesh, um, is, we bought an 82% interest there, all in cash. And then additional markets and brand rights, you know, the rights to the brand, the rights to the intellectual property, we paid all for cash, and that was 470 million. So the headline value of the deal in totality, 4.6 billion. Um, and the Unilever consideration, the Unilever part of that, 3.3 billion, 2.66 in equity, 169 million plus 470 million in cash. So that's the fundamental construct. Now, I sat beside uh, Becky and, and, and um, some of the IR team yesterday when, when questions and calls were coming in. Um, so this question of what, what is the multiple, if you do a headline multiple, it looks like it's 31, 32 times. But there is uh, two components to that. There's a consignment agreement, which uh, we will provide to GSK's OTC business uh, for a period of time going forwards. And there's 400 million of cash on the balance sheet of that business. So when you adjust for that, it drops down to an EV EBITDA multiple of 28 times. And if you apply the synergy assumptions that Nitin uh, showed you on the last chart, we're, we're very comfortable that we get down below a 20x multiple post-synergy for the transaction. How to think about the, uh, the financial returns? We, we think it's very compelling. Um, so the first thing to note is that the equity that we used, and using Hindustan Unilever's equity as opposed to cash to acquire the largest part of the business, 
um, we were able to, uh, to, to unlock the benefits of a favorable exchange ratio between uh, the two businesses because Hindustan Unilever, up until yesterday, it's gone up again um, you know, in 24 hours yesterday, but it's on a 58x PE versus a 38x PE for the GSK business in India. So fairly consistently over the last few years, there's been about a 20x multiple delta between the equity of Hindustan Unilever and the equity of the GSK business in India. Um, and then how do we fundamentally think about value creation in this transaction? This is a very simple chart, but it's not that simple underneath it. But fundamentally, we thought, what have we traded out and what are we trading in? We are trading out 5.28% of the future cash flows of Hindustan Unilever, because we dropped our equity interest from 67 to 62. And we've traded in 61.92% of, the, um, of, of, of the, 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 the totality um, plus, the, uh, plus the synergies. And when you look at that comparison, that's how we calculated what we think are very attractive um, shareholder returns. This last chart is a little bit um, of, of a review of history, and I'm not in any way suggesting that the right way to view this is on a sort of cash basis sequentially. I'm not saying that the economic value of the transaction is on that chart where we're thinking about what have we given up in terms of the equity of Hindustan Unilever. But for those of you who want to, to think about the amazing run up uh, and, 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 and increase in value of Hindustan Unilever, um, you'll recall that we, the last time we invested cash into India in a substantial way was when we, uh, we acquired 15% uh, of the shareholding of Hindustan Unilever in a tender offer. And the price we paid per share there was 600 um, 600 rupees per share. The share price today is about 1,700 rupees per share. Uh, and therefore, we had a gain of 1.7 billion effectively on those shares that we acquired for Unilever. And we've used about one third of those shares, that 5.3 of the 15% in securing this transaction. And therefore, we've been able to take the gain that we had in the roll up of the shares and then use that to acquire a different set of cash flows and access to those synergies in the GSK. <coughs> Uh, India business and the fantastic brand that is Horlicks. So I'm not suggesting this is how you should view the mathematics, but if you want to go back and think about, you know, the last time we capitalized India, that was the price of the capitalization of India. Nitin. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a sense, uh, both in terms of the strategic case, the opportunity that we've got out here, and why it is, can be financially very attractive for us as we move forward. I now want to move and shift gears. We've spoken of the first pillar, which is the transformation of our portfolio. I want to shift to the transformation of our cost. And the transformation of our cost is absolutely critical for us to, to think about. Because in order for us to transform our portfolio with speed, shift to the new segments that I referred to, it is likely that we will have to invest. It is likely that there will be, in the early days, an impact on our margins in that move. But that we have to do. We have to do, because otherwise, we won't have a portfolio which is right for tomorrow. And yet, and yet we need to make sure that we are in a position to, um, to increase the margins by about 500 basis points. Our margins, if you recollect, were 16.1% last year. How are we going to do that? We have, over the last year or so, put in place a very comprehensive end-to-end -end solution or a program which looks at structurally reducing our costs of supply chain. It looks at structurally reducing our overheads. And it is looking to have a sharp step up in our ongoing value improvement program that we have, our continuous improvement program. The combination of these three, we believe, needs to give us sufficient headroom to reinvest in the business for the portfolio transformation and the competitive battles and some of the capability building that is required, leaving behind 500 basis points that flows into the bottom line. Now, it's been about a year that we've been developing it, but each one of those three, th three pillars that you see have su sufficient substance behind them to give us the confidence that while more work needs to be done, but it gives us the confidence that this is indeed a doable task. That's what we are working towards, and that's how we think we will manage the dual objectives of delivering the bottom line and transforming our portfolio, which is crucial for us to step up our growth rates to uh, what we want them to be. 
If we were to do this, and indeed when we were to do this, the value creation out of this business will be immense because it will mean a faster growing business at margins which are very, very healthy as we move forward. Now, you can transform the portfolio, you can transform your cost structure to deliver margins, but frankly, we don't transform the speed with which we are able to act in this organization. It counts for nothing because the opportunities are no longer waiting for us. While there is plenty of growth opportunity in the market, the reality is that in the recent past, it is the small brands which have captured bulk of the opportunity and not the big players. And why is that? It's simply because small brands have been quicker to embrace the changes which are taking place and have been swifter to address the opportunities which are there. That's the only reason. We need to change that. And I think the changes that we made with Connected for Growth two years ago has already led to significant shifts in the way we are operating. It has made for a simpler, more connected organization. It has improved the pace of innovation that we've got. Uh, we have already reduced the cycle time of innovation by about a third, and more needs to happen. I talked about earlier how many new brands we had launched in the last one year, and that's just a reflection of the incredible innovativeness that exists in our business. And what we've really done through C4G is liberated people. We've pushed decision-making closer to the market and closer to the consumer, and that has been quite transformational for us. Several examples I can talk about. There's one out here, which is, let's take the Lipton example. It's quite interesting. The Lipton green tea ice cream, it sounded an odd idea when somebody suggested it, is, but people in the Netherlands were keen to try it out. The new framework allowed them to try it out. And what started off as a small idea in the Netherlands quickly moved across. It's in Romania, the Czech Republic, across the Baltics, it's in Greece, it's in Italy. We now have a Lipton green tea ice, uh, ice lolly. That's the speed with which we're moving. And you would have heard of the success that we've had with Kinder, an idea to license in the brand. And in just two markets that we've been around, in Germany and in France, it's been a spectacular success. Lots of examples telling us about the tremendous opportunity that we have. And with this shift that we are making, I just want to end by talking about one other area that we need to move the needle big time, which is in terms of our capabilities. There are many capabilities that a company always needs to build, but sometimes there are a few which are more important than everything else. And that the one which I want to refer to is a capacity and capability to do more data-driven marketing. Build decision, precision marketing muscle in the organization. Every one of my predecessors and colleagues have spoken about this. We are doing a massive amount of work in this area to drive internal capability building. And it is at all levels of the organization, right from a person who joins to someone uh, like me who has to go through certain courses in order to build capability and understand how the space is changing. Now, we can do all the training that we want internally, but the pace of change will still not be fast enough unless we bring in trained people into this organization. So as a team, we've decided that over the next, or, or starting, I think, five or six months ago, we decided every new entrant at a work level one and two, which is really the start of where people get in into the marketing team, every new entrant who comes in has to be first certified to be a digital expert and having the savviness to, uh, to operate in the world that we find ourselves before that person is assessed by marketeers to judge on uh, business acumen, connecting the dots, creativity, curiosity, any other quality that you might want to judge uh, to select a person as a marketeer. Now, if you were to do this, just visualize what can happen over the next 12 to 18 months. About 15 to 20% of our organization will have people who bring digital to a completely different level. And it is these people in the organization which will put further pressure on the rest of the organization and drive a step up in the pace at which internal capability building will happen. And that combination, hopefully, will help us get to the goal that we've set for ourselves, which is to shift all our market, digital marketing to being precision-led and get to our ability to build one-on-one -on -one relationship with the one billion people that we want. And that's really the space that we are in. Now, that's as far as the strategy is concerned from a global perspective. I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Sudhir. And he's going to give you a sense 
of how this strategy plays out in South Asia. I've got this. You've got something. Hi, hi, my name is Sudhir. I'm the Vice President for Foods and Refreshments. Today's actually a very special day for me because thanks to my association with the Horlicks deal, I've actually crossed 10 likes on Facebook, which is my big target for the year. Uh, many of you know of India as the land of opportunity, and you think of internet and e-commerce and the Flipkart deal, telecom, infrastructure. But by far and away, the biggest opportunity in India uh, is in foods and refreshments. Foods and refreshments, consumption is about 60% of the Indian GDP. Foods and refreshments is about 55% of it. So this is the big opportunity in India. Uh, it's a 500 billion euro market, own less than 10% of it, 500 billion euros without tobacco and alcohol, another 600 billion euros with it. Uh, less than 10% of it is what we call value-added foods. And there's a huge headroom for growth, like in many categories, but very, very markedly here. 43 euros per capita consumption versus 85 in Indonesia and versus you know, 1,200 in, 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 in the western parts of the world. So huge sort of headroom to grow in this category. Our share of play, we're a big player, uh, one of the biggest after yesterday's deal, but our share of play in the value-added segment is a very small 5%. Uh, the basic conundrum that HUL or Unilever in India faces is a two-fold conundrum. The first is we've actually got, surprise, surprise, a very strong foods and refreshment business in India, even without uh, GSK. We've got a business that is now coming, reaching a billion euros, 16% segmental margins, playing in several categories. Uh, and it's one of those businesses where every single category has been a uh, growing share and is either number one in most or in one or two categories, number two. So we've actually got a very strong portfolio of fast growing, uh, competitively growing brands. But the problem that we face is we're actually playing for legacy reasons. Bulk of our foods business is tea. And for legacy reasons, we actually built tea in India 100 years ago, Brookborn and Lipton, when they were competing with each other. But we play in a relatively smaller part of the market. We play in 15% of the market that's only growing at 9% versus the balance 85 that's growing at 17%. And for the, what Nitin mentioned, the parts of the market that we're playing in is highly penetrated. Tea has 90 plus penetration in India. Uh, the non-unilever parts of the market have much lower penetration at 20%. So that's the conundrum of our foods business uh, that we're fundamentally facing in India. And as a consequence of it, our strategy is simply twofold. The first is our existing businesses, we must grow it faster. There's still huge potential for consumption in this country. And I'm going to talk about an example of purpose, an example of insights, and an example in market development. And secondly, we've got to pivot our business to higher growth categories. Part of it is the kind of stuff that we did yesterday, but part of it is accelerating what we call gray spaces, which is we're present in a few cities, we're present in Unilever, but not present in India, which I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about. So let me first talk to you about growing existing businesses faster and how do we do it through brands. Uh, let's take the example of tea. Tea is a classic Indian market and a classic Unilever position. We're market leaders. We've got much higher shares. It's a massive market, almost a million tons, the largest tea drinking country in the world, certainly the largest black tea drinking country in the world. We've got much higher shares at the top of the pyramid and don't operate at the bottom of the pyramid. We've got to upgrade consumers from loose tea to simply package to our brands. And there are two ways in which we do it, through blending expertise, because everybody wants tea slightly differently in India, uh, and through building more emotional connect with tea. A couple of years ago, when I just entered this category, we had done a study where we asked consumers, what would happen if your morning cup of tea wasn't given to you? And the large answer was, we'd commit suicide. So that's the, that's the Indian relationship with tea and chai. Uh, we've got a mother brand, which is Brook Bond, uh, and we've been doing a lot of work on building uh, a purpose through it, just through great world-class advertising. For a piece of work a few years ago, we won a Grand Prix at Cannes. It's only one of two pieces of work in India that's won a Grand Prix at Cannes. I'd like to show you a piece of advertisement that we're going to air very soon uh, on Brook Bond. Can I please have the Brook Bond ad? एक वक्त था जब पूरी कॉलोनी इनके हाथ की चाय पीने के लिए आती थी, पर तीन साल पहले ने भूलने की बीमारी हो गई, अल्जाइमर्स। बस कॉलोनी भी इनको भूल गई। हाँ। 
अमित चाय तो तूने बहुत अच्छी बनाई बेटा अरे रहने दो झूठ मत बोलो <laughs> वैसे मेरा नाम अमित नहीं है अमित इनका बेटा है जो अमेरिका में रहता है आता रहता है मैं नूतन आंटी का पड़ोसी हूँ और मुझे लगता है कि अपनों को भूल जाना सबसे बड़ी बीमारी है आधी आधी और हो जाए एकदम अभी लो रेड लेबल स्वाद अपने पन का so that's the kind of work that we've been doing on our flagship brand brook bond and we've had spectacular results after a decade we've taken market leadership in india and we continue to zoom ahead in terms of volume growth so close to double digit volume growth in a category like this uh, and and it's been a really wonderful run for our tea business uh, based on purpose driven work that we've done on brook bond the second piece of uh, thing that drives existing growth is and a good example is green tea which is trading up through market development a uh, wild tea is a wonderful natural product one of the reasons that many indians have pot bellies is that they have it with high fat milk and a lot of sugar if you go outside when you go to the market and have a cup of chai outside you you, you it's actually a dessert in india uh one of the things that we've been doing is green tea has been the solution for it we've got an opportunity to upgrade we think it's the healthier way to drink tea you get the same kick that tea gives you without the calories that follow and it's financially a lot lot better for us Uh, we've been doing a lot of consistent advertising on how Indians should move from black tea to green tea, even though we're the leaders in black tea. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of interesting work around digital targeting. The fact of weight loss is different people have different attitudes to weight loss. Different times of the year, the same person has a different attitude, and different times of the day, the same person has a different attitude. I start the morning saying, "I'm not going to eat very much." I don't end the day like that. So we know how it uh, how it progresses. So we've been doing we've. basically got four cohorts not always demographic often psychographic uh, and we run four pieces of different creatives on uh, digital based on time of day time of year and type of person so that's a really good example of uh, how we use digital to flex our muscles around green tea this is again a category that was not present we were sub 15 share just 4 years ago we're now bordering on 50 share of the market and we've grown volumes 20 times in this market just being consistent on a benefit and being clever on our media reach Uh, with digital uh finally the third example is really catch up it's a category that is a large category but still relatively under penetrated and what we've unlocked in india is a very indian trigger so catch up is not really a snack additive in india consumers are a bit guilty uh indulging with catch up but we found an insight really around what we call the tiffin anxiety that mums face which is the biggest anxiety mums faces if the tiffin comes back home half eaten mums are not very happy they see it as a a front on their personal mumness so uh, i'd like to play the kisan ad please dekhna pehle din hi sab dost ban jayenge and you go no हंड्रेड परसेंट रियल टोमेटो ऐसी बना किसान केचप जब ये हो रोल में और रोल हो डब्बे में तो सब बन जाए दोस्त और डब्बा हो जाए खाली So we've had uh, very good results here as well. We took market leadership four or five years ago. We continue to grow market leadership, but more importantly, we're growing penetration in this category, which is a 25% penetrated category in urban. Quite similar to, for example, the the health food drinks beverage business. We've been growing penetration at 100 bips a year. Uh, finally, let me talk to you about. I'm not going to talk about white spaces through acquisition. I think Graham and Nitin have covered it. But let me talk about two categories which I call gray spaces. The first of them is ice creams. uh ice creams is a surprisingly large market in india and we're a uh, surprisingly small player in india we've actually got very high market share in the six or seven cities that we operate in some time ago we took a call rightfully so to operate in the seven citadels in india uh, but the market has rapidly gone below us uh, into a lot of small cities where we have much lower market share we've done two things to and we've done it very fast and with a lot of speed we've sort of seen this opportunity and done two things The first thing is we've driven organic expansion. In 2014 that was our distribution of ice cream in India. This is 2018 and you know 2 years from now you'll see a sort of communist flag there we hope uh, when you come back. So we want to cover the whole country the way we do it with uh, you know our our regular products. The second thing that we've done which is not very well noticed is 
uh, a couple of months ago, we bought a small business, which was a low-cost business, so very high market share in one part of India called Aditya Milk, which is an example of expansion, again, through acquisitions in ice cream to build scale rapidly. So what's happened in our ice cream business is we were very content with double-digit volume growth, but low double-digit volume growth, and we've now opened up the business to having you know, high double-digit, crossing the teens type volume growth in ice creams as a consequence of our strategy. The second one, uh, which I want to talk about, which is again a gray space, is the food solution space, a massive opportunity like most things are in India. Uh, but in this particular case, we've taken, we know China has got a great UFS business for Unilever. We've basically taken the best products that sell in China and Southeast Asia and got them to India and have started building a UFS business that's frankly growing exponentially. So it's well past the teens, and this business is now growing exponentially and is very, very profitable as we grow. So those are two examples of gray space expansion. Uh, I'll now hand over to Nitin again. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhir. I hope uh, that gives you a sense of uh, how this strategy is being deployed in India. Uh, also possibly gives you a sense of how exciting the opportunity in this part of the world can be when you just hear of growth rates when he talks about volume growth rates, not in the low double digits, but crossing the teens. I'm saying that sort of stuff is, uh, is uh, rare to find in most places, but this business has shown that it has the capacity to do it. Um, I have really nothing more to say at this stage. I'm going to just uh, wrap up, uh, but uh, quickly remind you in terms of what we spoke of. Uh, I do believe, I do believe that the FNR business globally has a tremendous opportunity to drive value creation. It is not often that you have a strategy in place which can step up growth and have such a sharp expansion in margins that we've got over the next few years. It is, um, I've said right at the beginning that there is work to be done. Getting the uh, savings that I talked about is crucial. The transformation that we need is on all pillars. And uh, I would be overstating if I said that we had every little bit of savings identified. But I want to remind everyone again and tell them that there's enough work done which gives us the confidence that we can get the savings which are required, which will enable us to invest in this business, to grow this business, and leave behind the 500 basis points that we want. Uh, the opportunity in emerging markets must be obvious after what Sudhir has talked about. And in the end, this business is a business that we want to make sure is a purpose-led and a future-fit business. Um, we are driving transformation across all those three levers. And last but not the least, in the world that we live in, agility and our ability to sense consumer changes and trends that we are seeing and being able to respond to it is going to be the difference between winning companies and the companies which fall by the wayside. Connected for Growth has made a huge shift, but there is still at least one more gear left, if not two, in terms of how much more we can push the idea of Connected for Growth and leverage the incredible capacity that this organization has to win with people and serve society the way we want to and make this business a force for good. That's it from me. And uh, with that, there are a few minutes left. We can have any questions uh, that anyone might have. Thank you, uh, Martin Debu, Jeffries. Uh, Nitin, the, the plan is pretty aggressive. Your, your implied retention rate on the gross savings is sort of 67%. The retention rate on the whole 2020 plan at Unilever is more like 40%. So you're being extremely bullish on the retention rate. I would never <coughs> underestimate you given what you delivered in home care. But when I think about the disruptive threats in foods, I'm just wondering why you can be so confident you're going to hold on to the savings. And, and the other question is for Graham. Graham, it's an eloquent defense of the equity merger. But just what, why, why have a slightly messy arrangement where GSK are owning part of HUL, why not just do it for cash and keep it simple? I'm slightly bemused why GSK wouldn't have preferred that. It's probably not, you may not feel comfortable commenting on that, but I'd just be interested to hear. So, so I think uh, my response uh, would be as follows, and I'll let Graham comment later. Uh, indeed, it is aggressive. It is by no, no means a done deal that you can sit here and say you can bank it all. I'm in acutely conscious of that. And the only way that we will find a way to de-risk it is push the savings that you see here at 750 basis points and keep looking for more savings that we get, which will keep 
create a further cushion that we've got in order to enable us to deliver things. The other point I want to make is that it is Unilever's commitment to get to a 20% by 2020. And it gives us some flexibility. I think uh, right up front, Graham said, if ever there was a choice, we would prioritize growth over margin. Uh, but as a totality, we find it possible for us to get this business in the near term to about 21% operating margin. Hmm? Martin, on the, on the structure for the deal, we, we were always very motivated to, to, uh, <coughs> to go forward with equity, principally because it allows us to de-risk the relative high valuations that exist in India. And, and as I said, we've got a you know, much <coughs> higher valuation in HUL than the, than, the, uh, than the Horlicks business had. So we were, we were very motivated to, to use that. A second reason is that by doing it as an equity merger, it's tax-free for the GSK shareholders and it's, there's no tax implications for the HUL shareholders. There's a bit of a tax advantage. And finally, <clears throat> if you were to use cash, um, there are mandatory squeeze-out thresholds in buying public businesses in India. And that would mean that if you, if you, you, would, be, you would have to trigger an offer for the remaining uh, minority, and that's done at a VWAP rate, and there's oodles that you can go away and read yourselves about how that gets calculated, but it could be quite expensive. That's quite relevant, I think, because I, there's a whisper out there uh, that I just saw that, uh, I mean, somehow Nestle were about a billion adrift of our valuation. I don't know how you know what Nestle's valuation is, because that may be what they were going to pay in cash for the minority, for the, for the GSK shares, but you don't know what would have been paid for the rest of the minority because on a cash basis, as I said, you would have to offer for the totality of the business. So I doubt very much, and I hate to speculate about it, but I doubt very much that that's the total picture uh, in, 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 in doing that. Um, yeah, that's it. I, w I won't comment on, on, on GSK, but as we know, I mean, they, are, they, they, they have been looking to, uh, to, to, to secure cash, and our expectation is that they have the opportunity in a very, very liquid and, and, and fully valued and transparent stock to, uh, to, to secure cash over time. I think uh, time is up and I'm conscious that you've got an exciting program after this where you get a chance to go and see the market. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Richard. <laughs>